honesty is probably the number one character trait that a, a realtor needs to have and anybody in general. Hello everyone and welcome back to Revaluate. On this episode, we discussed extensively the profound impact of government policies and the three-tier approach by the government of Canada in tackling the housing crisis. Joining me once again on this podcast is John Flynn, the principal broker of John Flynn Realty. John is an expert in the realty business and a prominent figure in Ontario's realty. John and I touched on the current housing market prices. We discussed extensively some predictive data sets for future prices as well, and the implication of interest rates and immigration on the government's three-tier problem-solving strategy in Canada. The standard of living has gone down because you're living in basements, apartments for mm -hmm. $2,000 a month. Meanwhile, three years right. ago, you could rent a whole house for $2,000. It's like modern day slavery where you're literally just using them for their money to prop up GDP so they'll come spend money, but there is no real future for them here. We also scrutinized whether the market still prioritizes investors over families, and we debated the merits of extended amortization periods in Canada's 2024 budget that was just released. So now you can borrow more money from your retirement and add that to your debt. So again, we're just extending and pretending um, that people can afford homes by, by stretching out payments and giving them more debt. All this interest and debt payment is going to slowly suck money out of the economy. There is a whole lot more you're about to find out on this episode. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like this video as well. That will be very helpful for me. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Um, so, um, my major goal for today's chat is to discuss the state of the housing market and um, kind of review some of the data that we've seen in the market since our last conversation. And to think about it, right, since our last conversation, it's almost six months already. Would you believe that? Wow. Yeah, it doesn't seem that long. Right, right. So I think um, I should first of all say thank you for uh, being a part of my podcasting journey. You were actually the second guest I had in the podcast, and I really appreciate that. And I think that gave me a good head start, uh, especially um, thinking about the the method also that you used to kind of backlink the video that I did together with you the first time on the podcast on your own channel. That gave me a good head start. So I wanted to. Just take a second and thank you for that, actually. Thanks very much. No problem. Yeah, no problem. You're welcome. And uh, it was a pleasure being on. And I'm glad that I can help people in the YouTube and kind of that, that podcast community because uh, that's, of course, where my head is, too. Right. So you've been doing this for a very long time, I realize. Yeah. Uh, no, not really. Probably. Let me see. I started doing like my podcast version uh, in 2022 early 2022 maybe at the end of 2021 but i have played around okay. with some just general youtube stuff but yeah just uh yeah, a little over a couple of years right so i, I realized the the video from the last time actually got about seven thousand views for for a beginner i don't think that's shabby at all yeah so, that's really good yeah yeah thanks thanks again for that but let, let me pick on some of the conversations that I saw from the last time. Of course, I wouldn't get back to some of the comments that uh, was on the video uh, snippet that I sent to you, that people complained about the, the audio background on the video. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get into that. Yeah, that's, I'll, that's, I'll talk, that's YouTube. <laughs> right, right. I, I will talk about the positive one to start with. So on Twitter, I put a comment here and there in people's post, or an X now, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, after the conversation that I had with you. And I realized one thing. Almost everyone that commented on that video says, oh, John is the best and John is an honest guy. How does that co come across to you each time that you see this kind of comment? So I, yeah, you know what? I would say that they're comparing with me with the stereotypical realtor that, you know, is buy now. It's always a great time to buy and and that's kind of the narrative where i'm the guy that calls it out now many realtors one on one not all not all of them but there are many many realtors out there that have the exact same opinions i do 
and we'll gladly have that conversation with you in private. But, you know, they feel it's risky to call things out as they see them, um, you know, in public and on the records. Uh, so that's that's the problem with that. So they're, it's like the hidden class of people. So I always say, I, I hopefully I'm not the only honest one, and I'm not. Um, but again, it's because of that, uh, you know, the, the industry will, will, you know, sacrifice or crucify them if they speak mm -hmm. the truth in the wrong way. So that's why they're, they're just scared. So how much can you really be honest, especially in the real estate industry? Uh, wouldn't that affect bigger deals, especially from, from investors? So, yeah, so I, I don't, I don't really work with investors, um, at all, actually. Uh, we, you know, we'd get into some management stuff, but that's a different thing altogether. But as, as far as sales go, uh, I don't work with investors. I work with families. So for me, it's, it's not an issue and that's by choice. I don't really want to work with them because it's, it's just money, 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 and it's not what I started doing in the business. So, um, but yeah, you do run the risk if that's what you target and you're, you're bad mouthing the speculation and investors and that kind of uh, business, I guess, it will get you in, in trouble. So I assume you're talking about corporate investors in this case. So what if I wanted to buy a second home for a rental? Would you uh, work with me? Yeah, well, so I wouldn't be too eager to work with you, honestly, because it, it depends on the situation. But I am, again, the realtor that sells homes to families to live in. And that's how I started. And that's how I've remained in the business. So when I say prices need to go down, I, I'm not upsetting really any of my clients because even if they are homeowners, they're going to go down when they're going to purchase a new one anyway. So yeah, I, I, I group all investors as investors, whether you're corporate or private, but then I do classify them into speculators and real investors when real investors are buying products that are sustainable and can be rented at market prices and not worrying about packing a bunch of students in there to pay the bills while the price goes up. So yeah, if you were legitimate, um, I wouldn't say no, but I'm again, I'm, I, I really don't like that side of the business right now. I see. So it looks like you really prioritize honesty as a virtue. Uh, would you say honesty is actually a greater virtue than kindness, let's say? Uh, yeah, they, they kind of go hand in hand, but I would say honesty is probably the number one, I guess, virtue or uh, character trait that a, a realtor needs to have and anybody in general. Kindness, anyone can be kind. Um, you know, uh, there's a saying I can't remember, but you know, like, let me kiss you while I do something, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, I screw you or something. So, so yeah, kindness can be, can be a mask for something else, um, to get what you want. Right. Uh, children are great at this where, you know, they're so nice to you when they want something and after they get it right, uh, they're not so kind anymore. So yeah, I, I, I would agree to say honesty is, uh, of utmost important importance. Right. Right. I, I think I agree with you, actually. Um, honesty on the scale of human character, I think it supersedes any other uh, virtue, um, kindness, um, being reserved or being extroverted. Yeah, I think yeah. it supersedes all of that. And I, I think that you have to be in a position to be honest. And I have the privilege of being honest in my work because, you know, I've done it. I, I'm 20 years in now and I have a good client base and you know, I've, it's not that I, I'm the top agent. I'm not, I'm just an average agent agent, but I comfortable enough where I don't have massive amounts of bills to pay. And I can be honest and, you know, t speak the truth, uh, and kind of select the business I want to select, um, where a lot of young agents or newer agents, you know, they're struggling and a sales, a sale, they need the sale. So it's hard to be honest when you're starving, I guess is what I'm right. trying to say. Right. So I think the goal here is not to be a, a John Flynn royalty becoming a, a billion dollar a real estate company. Is yeah. It? And then, you know what, just like anything, when you have corporate interests to serve, you know, or shareholders and, you know, to please, you can, your, your morals, you know, come secondary to the, the bottom line. Right. And that's, that's where I don't ever want to be. And, um, I, I, again, I'm, this is why I'm just an average agent. I, I don't try to grow and manage and be a big office or anything like that. 
All right. All right. Well, I'll let people deal with the rest of that conversation in the comment section, but we'll leave the philosophical or psychological conversation and get into real estate data now. So since our last chat, which you said is about six months ago, I realized the prices have stayed relatively the same, not significant enough in the price difference for us to say the prices are really lower as it were. And uh, by the way, I'll recommend that conversation for anyone watching this right now to check it out. But you said in that conversation that prices will go down. So let's look at some of the charts that you sent me here and the one also that I plotted for myself from some of the data out there. So let's start with this. So this is me comparing the data since the last time we chatted, which is about six months ago. So April 2024 versus October 2023. Prices in British Columbia, that's um, in the red, which is 2024 today, in the blue uh, six months ago. It's relatively the same. If you compare that all the way to Saskatchewan, which has the lowest price in the country right now, it's relatively the same. So if you said it was going to drop, the prices were going to drop, are we counting the chicken before they hatch here? What do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, so... It's a good point. And of course, my counter uh, argument to that would be we have seasonality involved here, right? So every spring, prices go up. And we actually see some huge price swings in the last, uh, actually since 2017, I uh, was just doing some research today. And in 2017, the prices went up from the beginning, from January to April, they went up $89,000. And then they went down $87,000 the four months following that. And in the last few years, we've had the biggest swing up was around, from my memory here, is around $157,000. And that was from 2021 to the peak in 2022. And then after that, we dropped $187,000. So people, and this is where seasonality comes into play. So every year the spring comes and the narrative again is, oh, this is it. You better get into the market and buy now. If you don't buy now, you're going to be left behind and you'll never be able to afford a house. So this is what we're seeing now, especially from October to uh, April right now. So seasonality plays a role, but I have studied the data and over the last few years, and we were seeing some interesting um, patterns. And these are patterns that people use on stocks, but uh, I don't know if you have them in the um in the charts here yeah, today. Yeah, I think we'll look. get yeah, to them in a second. So yeah, right. we'll get to them. So so again, I'll, I'll leave that there, that it, this is a seasonal thing right now. And okay. uh, yeah, we'll look at the patterns and the charts uh, in a minute. Right. So w would you pass some comment about this chart that you sent me? Are you, this is more of a, since the peak in 2022, I assume? Yeah, so this is, these are the, yeah. Uh, uh, percent change from the peak uh, since uh, 2022. Most places are 2022. Now Calgary at the bottom has set uh, new highs this year. And I think they set a new high last year. Um, of course, Calgary was one of the major cities in Canada that had the lowest prices compared to the other ones. And now we see a lot of investors from Ontario and even BC flooding there to speculate on that market. And of course, they're seeing uh, record high prices now. But everywhere else has, uh, they're still well below their peak and uh, by different amounts. Now, this was uh, just a recent chart from, uh, I think this is March data. Yeah, this is March's data. Okay. So, again, this is in the spring after we've seen a, a jump and the prices are still down by these amounts. Okay, so let's also talk about this one. I think this one is important. I had actually pulled it up from RBC Economics website and I think what I interpret here is the concept of home affordability by province in Canada. And if you look at it in Canada generally, it looks like about 20% of the people are able to afford a single dwelling family uh, home and about 45% are able to afford condominiums. What do you interpret from this, seeing this plot? So actually, that's surprising for BC, <laughs> but I guess that includes <laughs> all of BC, uh, not just Vancouver. So maybe it's not that surprising. Right. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, of course, BC and uh, because of Vancouver is the most unaffordable in uh, Canada. And uh, yeah, when we get to uh, Ontario here, uh, next in line. 
So yeah, mm-hmm. the affordability, it, it's actually an affordability crisis right now, obviously in Canada, and uh, it's going to be an ongoing issue. So this doesn't surprise me. And of course, as you get into uh, Saskatchewan, um, you know, you see more than 50% of the people can afford uh, a single family and of course, condos even higher. So yeah, not, not surprising. Right. And uh, this is uh, well reported uh, from RBC. <laughs> Right, I think this looks like a bit a bit of a disaster here. If uh, if just about twenty percent of the people in the country are able to afford detached homes, we're gonna get to a very important conversation later on, where I think the Canada is slowly moving towards becoming a multi dwelling home country, not detached homes anymore. But I think I'll show the data when we get there. But I, I was curious about the rental market as well. So I pulled some data from out there. Uh, I think this is from uh, rental.ca. This one shows that Vancouver market is still about 3,000 on the average, uh, right up here. And uh, here Mm -hmm. in Ontario, Toronto is about 2,800. Ottawa is about 2,300 still. I I missed some of the data here. Halifax also showed about uh, 2,200. So from west all the way to the east, the price is still about the same as six months ago when we had this conversation. I will show you this one. I'll, I'll let you comment on this. I think it's similar to the, to, to, to the one we were talking about just now. The only rental markets that have depreciated over the last one year is in British Columbia and as well in Nova Scotia. I will let you pass comments on that in a second. But then if you go to the... So the trend generally in Canada, I think this is, a, this is since 2019, you see that there's actually been a rise in the cost of rental in the country. Would you just comment about all these put together? I can go back to the previous one so you can chat about them. So I think overall, the, well, the rent prices are reflected generally from the sale prices. And it's not that the demand, there is a, obviously a high demand for rentals with a lack of affordability for purchasing and the amount of immigration. But uh, when you have a lot of speculation and a lot of investors buying, they need to cover their costs. So they really help drive up the rental costs too, because it's not about what it's worth now, it's what about they need or what they need to cover their costs. And that's why you see places like Alberta and Saskatchewan with the biggest jumps overall. Um, Right. It's because because of their their prices have gone up so much more uh, percentage wise than the rest of Canada. So, yeah, you're this is, again, it's a result of both demand, but also uh, requirements or needs for these quasi investors. And I call them quasi because these aren't experienced investors. They kind of buy the house and then worry about the rental rate after. Um, so that this is why we have a double edged sword that are driving up rent prices. Yeah, well, wh- whether we like it or not, whether um, the the quasi investors, like you call them, or the mm-hmm. the bigger investors, I think it's whatever you buy, you're gonna sell at the end of the day, right? Um, people paying high mortgages eventually is gonna drive drive the market price for for the rental up as well. Uh, I think that's the that's that's the aftermath of um, the rising cost of home ownership that we're seeing on the rental, like you said. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you had sent me some of these plots as well. I want us to chat about it. At the end of the day, actually, what I want us to chat about today is the the policies that we're seeing currently from the federal government and how that is shaping, uh, or let's say how that has shaped the the past in the housing crisis in the present and how it's going to shape the future. But I think leading up to that, it's worth going through some of the data set that you showed me here, uh, which is about uh, the net supply and the housing trajectory. I'm going to let you talk about them since you're the expert in the industry here. So I'll go to the first one here, uh, just in order. Um, What do you make from this? Yeah, so I'll go through these and I can kind of one leads to another. So I'll go through them and you can change them up as we go. So All right. this is, and these are from my estimates. There is no data to that this is readily available to take and say, okay, this much is from this source and this much is from that this source. I've gathered this data from my research. 
And from what I can find uh, with numbers from different areas, whether it's from CREA or our local boards. So again, this is a very good estimate, but they're not totally accurate, right? Um, and even when it comes to this, so this first chart here, this is the, you know, the, the housing inventory. And I said adjusted because on the MLS part, the green part, a lot of the listings would be canceled and relisted or have been listed in the last 12 months. So I eliminated that um, to kind of make an adjustment there. So it's not the same listings that are coming up six months later because they didn't sell or they were canceled. So ultimately about 28% of the inventory um, in Canada, and this is not sales, this is inventory, comes from new home completions. And the remaining 71.8 or 72% comes from the MLS, the resale market. So then we get into the next chart is the sources of inventory and it shows how it's changed. So the top left right. there, 2014, of course you had, uh, the, the, the one thing, the blue section there is fairly consistent. We have new completions or new homes and it ranges around the $200,000 or 200,000 unit mark every year, especially in the last 10 to 20 years. We've had 200,000 plus or minus 15,000 or so, depending on the year. So that's, it's a very consistent or a constant number. So that doesn't change. And that's supply. Nobody's taking away from that supply. Then in the red, we have owner occupied, where that, um, again, that's a net um, contributor to the market because a lot of, well, owner occupied, especially in the red here, they're selling a house and they're buying a house. So they're giving inventory, but they're taking it away. So again, it's uh, there's no net new inventory, but they're not taking anything away either. And of course, estate sales and power of attorneys from older people going into homes and passing away, that's fairly consistent around 5% a year or so. It was actually less right. back in 2014 by my estimates, and this is from data that I pulled. And of course, you have bank sales and, pow and uh, power of sales. They always make up a little bit. It was a lot higher actually back in 2014. And this is data from the uh, Central Bankers Association. And so it was higher back then. And of course, it's dropped off. We were near all-time lows recently in the 2023 chart. And then you have the investors. This is not the, again, not purchasing. This is the inventory. So uh, yeah, we have the inventory at just under 15% back in 2014. And of course, um, now we're seeing more inventory come from investors because they they have bought and of course they do sell and now you're and in the future I'm estimating there's going to be even more so about 22% as opposed to 15% in 2020 or 2014 and just under 20% in 2023 so the investors again they are kind of like the swing and the this is just them adding inventory now when we move on to the next chart so the next chart is the net supply. So what's changing? Like, so now we're taking into consideration the purchasing too, because if people are purchasing, so at the bottom here in 2014, you see the gray. So they're neutral. They're purchasing as many homes as they're selling, the homeowners. New construction, they're always giving inventory to the market. It's new supply or it's positive supply coming to the market. And in 2014, in this chart here, investors would have given net supply to the market. So they would have been selling a little bit more than they were buying. So it's a positive thing. And if you look at inventory numbers from back in 2014, we had like six, seven months of inventory. So we had lots of inventory. Nowadays, in 2023, this chart, so they are taking away it where it's red. So yes, they're giving 19.6% to the market, but they're buying like 25 or 30 percent. And you know, these are the numbers that are reported. And you can see these in the news. And there's estimates that in some provinces, they were buying up to 40 percent of the listings. So, again, they're taking away inventory. Now, I estimate that as the financial markets change and financial conditions change and interest rates, of course, they will start to add. So going to the next chart, 2023, comparing it to 2025, once those right. things change, they will be neutral. So they'll be selling as many units as they'll be buying. Right now, I believe they're still buying a little bit more, but it's pretty close to neutral. Then you get to later on 2026 when conditions get tough and uh, mortgage renewals are coming up. 
because of course the mortgage renewals have only started we uh, especially from 2021 we haven't even hit them those will hit in 2026 for a lot of people so in 2026 you're going to see these investors and speculators they're going to be adding supply so they're going to be selling more properties than they're purchasing because of the need to do so because of high interest costs and whatnot so i guess my story with these charts was Investors really do control the supply because the other ones are fairly consistent. Home building or new construction, that's fairly consistent. They're not, they're always giving to the market. Uh, end users or owner occupied, they're usually neutral. They're taking away as many as they're giving. And of course, estate sales and bank sales, they, they don't really change that much. Um, it's the investors that can really change the market. And we saw that in 2021 and 2022. They were buying up tons of properties and we had no inventory. So, uh, and it wasn't end users. I've always made this claim. It's always been the speculative purchasing and the investors. So again, as, the, as that changes, you'll see our months of inventory skyrocket um, as that becomes less attractive. And if, how does it become less attractive? From higher interest rates, maybe if the government can <laughs> build these 3D printed homes or what, I don't have much faith in that. But even without okay. that, um, we're going to see more inventory come we're already seeing it right uh, from the investors that that will continue to increase so i hope that explains my charts and the kind of theory behind it right right i think that makes it clearer actually to me i, I was trying to make sense of it but i just thought okay i'm gonna let you do it while we're doing this conversation but i think the major thing you're saying here is that the speculation about interest rates going up or staying the level where it is right now is what is going to cause more inventory to be in the market. Is that correct? Yeah. So the interest rates are, are the catalyst, of course. And, you know, I've done many charts where it shows the correlation. And so the interest rates are going to, they're going to create a weaker economy, higher unemployment. And once that happens, then it's going to take a while for the speculators. And we're already seeing it. Like the pre-constructions aren't selling to speculators anymore. So this takes time for the sentiment to change. Once people realize that, hey, I, I'm not making hundreds of thousands of dollars from you know signing a contract at a new condo building, they will taper off and uh, they'll start to sell off. There's only You're only going to hold on to a rental property for so long when it's not making money because there's tons of investors or speculators, whatever you want to call them, out there that they're losing money every month. And we're not talking about a few. There's like thousands and thousands of them. They can only do this for so long. They're hoping and praying that interest rates are going to come down. And many of them are hoping that interest rates are going to come down to like 1% or 2% like they used to be, which is not going to happen mm. anytime soon. So that's going right. to, and this is the point of higher interest rates to do this, right? Uh, of course, <laughs> the Bank of Canada is, you know, they're not blunt, but they say like, the, they'll say, well, unemployment's still too low and, you know, uh, it doesn't mean, and the economy is still too strong. What's the opposite? Weak economy and high unemployment. So this is what they want. And when people don't have jobs, they're not going to be able to pay their rent and they're not going to be able to pay their mortgage. So this is where you're going to see the inventory change. And it always cycles. Right. The economy cycles and the market cycle like this. And anyone that says house prices will never come down, well, the only way they're never going to come down is we, if we never have another recession and higher unemployment. So if that never happens, sure, they're going to be right. The prices will never come down. But the chances of unemployment never going up <laughs> and the recession never happening again are pretty slim. Like it, it happens, right? It's part of life. So Right, but there's there's also been a mixed messaging from the Bank of Canada of late, right? I think the last announcement held interest rate steady, but there was a signal that possibly in the next announcement, I think that's going to be in June, that there might be a cut in interest rate. I think wouldn't that set us back by a few miles again? You think? So, yeah. So one of the things again I've done in a chart before and is. You know, when interest rates start to fall, it's because the economy is doing so bad that they need to cut them. Now, last year, they made the mistake of pausing too soon and the market took off in the spring. This year, again, the market the market did well in February, very well because, well, the real estate market, because they were calling for cuts. They were calling for cuts in like, I think, April now. They were, they were saying they're going to cut and they keep pushing it back. And of course, the U.S. keeps pushing it back. So. The reason they're going to cut is because they have to, 
not to reward um, speculators and increase prices. If they see prices go up, they'll just start increasing interest rates again. And of course, inflation came in today. It's still 2.9%. So it's, it's, that is going to remain sticky. Now, and it's a tough job the Bank of Canada has because they're at the point where they're trying to like walk this fine line between saying, okay, yeah, we will lower interest rates when need be. I know you're hurting out there, but we can't do it yet because there's too, still too much exuberance in the market. So it's a, it's a tough one, but uh, there's no such thing as a soft landing either. Like they, they've talked about soft landings, but we've never had a soft landing. So <laughs> it's a tough job they have. Right. And, uh, it always ends the same way. Like it's, it's not going to end a different way. So um, I guess, you know, this time will be different is, is what people say. But uh, it's never different when it comes to recessions. Right. I, I think the factor that may make it a little more complicated this time uh, to, to address the issue with interest rate is a factor in our population. And I think our population is actually introducing the exuberance that you talked about into the housing market. Because right now, um, we have record um, immigration we talked about in the last conversation. I don't think we need to rehash that now. But I think that's going to make it a little tricky because uh, if rates go down now with a number of people that are sitting on the sides waiting for that to happen, I think they're going to jump back into the market. And won't we see a spike in prices again? Yeah. Except they, there is an unemployment in mass in the country. Yeah. So if they cut rates too soon, um, yeah, you're, you will see a, a, a spike in prices, right? Um, there's no doubt about it. But again, the metrics that the Bank of Canada is looking for is higher unemployment. And so you're going to see it's going to happen around the same time when they're going to start cutting rates and not too many people are going to be thinking about making money off of real estate at that point because we will be in economic turmoil of some kind. Maybe it'll be a mild recession, but they, and that's what a lot of people tell me, like once they cut rates, prices are going to go up. Well, that doesn't change affordability because if you have a lower rate, but a higher price, you're paying the same as you were now. So why wouldn't people just buy now with a higher rate and lower price if, if it is considered lower compared to what it will be in the future? Another argument people would say to me is if prices go down, real estate prices, well, investors are just going to buy them up then. And so I always say, just like they were buying up Bitcoin when it was $16,000 <laughs> US, like nobody wanted to touch it because you're like, it's going to go lower. Right. So when, and just like if you look at in the fall, so you could have bought a house uh, when we talked last time for fifty to seventy five thousand dollars less than you could buy it now, and nobody was buying them. There was the, the sales were very low, but of course the spring comes and people start buying them, and it's like you could have just saved money, and now you're you're paying fifty or seventy five thousand yeah. dollars more. So yeah, when nobody wants them, or it's the opposite, people are not going to be buying up these houses when they're cheap. They're going to be scared that they're going to go lower. Right. I think as a pitfall for most um, in, inexperienced investors, the the big corporations, I think they understand that principle better. I think buy when the market is low, um, mm -hmm. sell when it's high. Yeah. But I think for a lot of inexperienced investors, like you mentioned in the housing industry, that's what we've been seeing that right now when the prices are about 50K more, that's why I, that's when a lot of people are buying compared to, say, a few months or a year back that they could have bought the same homes. But I think it's just a matter of waiting and see how this is going to pan out. So let's transition into let's transition into um, the the action plan by the Canadian government to solve this housing crisis. So you had shared with me a link, and the link is where. Um, it's from Infrastructure Canada. That's where they're talking about the comprehensive guide from and the efforts of this administration to tackle the housing crisis. So let's look at that. Um, there is a three-tier approach. The first one is building more homes, and the second is making it easier to rent or to own a home. And the third is helping Canadians who can't afford a home. We'll try to unpack it one by one. There's a lot of points under each, each one of those headings, but I think we'll focus on the first one and then we see where that leads us. So under the first heading, building more homes, um, I am going to let you chat about it. You are <laughs> the expert in this case. Uh, maybe if there's not enough time to chat through everything, you can 
pick some of the best and just some of the worst in your own perception about um, this approach by the government and let's see where that takes us. Okay. So making the math work from home beaters. So, yeah, so I'll make this very simple <laughs> because I, <laughs> I, I did a pretty comprehensive review of this earlier today because it was something. Okay. And, and, and I said, after I read through it, I said, you know what? I need to separate this because there's a lot of there's a lot of politics in this for one, but uh, well the whole thing's politics. Today's the budget day and the confidence it's confidence in the government and all the rest of that. But I said, what what matters to me and to my clients? I sell homes, and whether the people are buying them or selling them, this is who I work with, and I work with families. So of course I filter through it. By the time I get down to the end of the first section, so building more homes. Most of the building more homes and all the, the first sections for, I forget how many sections there are in it. It was all to do with uh, apartment units and rental housing. So making the math work for home builders, it's talking about, yeah, you have it right there. So this is um, building more apartments and more rental units, right. low, low cost, whatever. We need them. Of <laughs> course we need them. That's great. But I didn't focus on that because it's not going to affect my business with selling homes it might help you know more units helps everybody but of course i do acknowledge that canada has been lagging behind in the construction of rental units because the policies worked against it instead of building rental units they're building pre-construction condos and selling them to the speculators so now we have overpriced rental units instead of affordable so if there was a critical error in kind of policies i believe with the government there the things that only affected my clients or the people I want to work with, not that I want to work with, but I do work with home buyers, was the new technologies. So this whole section was the new technologies to build homes faster and more affordably. And Correct. that was where I focused on. And it was talking about modular construction and 3D um, printing homes. And I've actually seen the, the you can pre 3D print homes. And um, you can look on YouTube at things, and it's pretty cool. Now it's it's still expensive to do, but it is another tool. With regards to like prefabricated or um, you know built homes that are built in factories, I did um, I did something this week. I think I talked about it on one of my YouTube channel or YouTube videos, or it was uh, on Twitter or X. But I got some great feedback and. You got to remember to build these homes, you have to still pay people to build them. You have to ship the mm -hmm. materials twice, once to the factory, and then you have to ship the completed product in sections or in, in a whole piece to the construction site. You still need a foundation. You still need the land. You still need right. the servicing. You still need the development fees. So, and people said it's actually more expensive to build. Now you can increase production because you have people building other homes on site traditionally, and you have people building in factories but it doesn't make it any cheaper. And these are tech. So these technologies that they're talking about, uh, the housing minister, Sean Fraser says they want to change. Like we've been building, doing things the same for hundreds of years. There's new technologies. We should be implementing them. Well, nobody's implemented them yet. And I'm trying to think, I want to study. I haven't done any research, but what countries do this? Is there any, can he, he didn't point to any examples of it decay in this country they they build like this i know in certain countries they build because they're remote areas and they have you know certain ways they do it but does this will this work in canada well you know is it this is just a dream like it, there's no real plan besides talk at this point right right so i i was actually uh I was in the market some years back trying to buy, and that was on the East Coast. There was a company out there at the time that was doing this pre-construction fab, uh, uh, factory fabricated homes. It sounded intriguing to me at the time, maybe because of my technological background and um, engineering background. I was quite curious, one, how efficient it is, and is it cost-saving, and is it time-saving? Those were the questions I posed to the company. And to my surprise, actually, what they mentioned to me as the key benefit in uh, doing in using such approach to, to, to do construction is that you're you're saving your your wood your wood uh, that is used for construction now from weather elements. Because mm -hmm. you find in most cases houses are constructed over several months in the winter, they are left standing out there. 
But they say when you construct them in the factory like that, you save them from those weather elements. It doesn't necessarily save you cost, neither does it save you time. That was what they identified. And I was curious because I thought, oh, it should save you time. But they said, mm -hmm. no, actually, because the, the factors in the construction process that take time is not in the actual erecting the structure, according to them. You still have to do foundation, um, the mm -hmm. sewage system, connect to utilities and whatnot. But, or, what, what would you think about that? Do you think that will save cost? Will it save time? And what part of the construction process actually takes the most time from your experience? So I don't think it'll save cost. And from my pre preliminary conversations and research, it won't. Um, so that's kind of here nor there at this point. That's the consensus. And it just makes sense that it, it wouldn't save save cost. Time, um, the, it would add to capacity, I think that. So again, you have people building traditional you know, homes and then you have factories building. So capacity, yes, I believe that you'll be able to build more homes. Now, when it comes to uh, the rest of the, again, servicing in, in lots and pouring concrete, now they already build homes too quick. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like counter, you know, productive to what we're talking about here. But when you pour a foundation, you're supposed to let that thing cure for like six to 12 months. I can't remember. I'm sure someone might correct us in the comments, but it's not Is that a correct? month. It's not two weeks. Like they, they pour concrete and they just start building on it like a month later. And a month's a long time. You're supposed to let that concrete cure and, and harden because that's when it strengthens, right? Um, so right. Pour, yeah, adding, it's not going to cut time, um, but it will add capacity. So yes, you should be able to get more homes built in a quicker amount of time by having these different sources of building, right? So yeah, it's uh, definitely not cost, though. I'd like to see the technology and how you can cut costs because even the 3D printing, which is fascinating, it, but it uses concrete. It's And concrete's like the most expensive part of a house when you're looking at single items while well, of the construction mm -hmm. of a house. Like my, my sister built a house and the first one she built, the foundation was $40,000. The next one was $100,000. So concrete... And cement costs are like have skyrocketed and they've remained because those are those are world markets that are dealing with those. Right. So when you're building a whole house from concrete, like, just think of the cost. Right. 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 And interestingly, we don't build the whole house with concrete out here in, in Canada. I think Unfortunately, where I come from, that's the case. <laughs> right? Yeah, we, That's another thing. I, our quality, like we build them from wood where, yeah, in my country, I come from Ireland, they're, they're block houses. They're so solid. Like, right. you know, the big bad wolf's not going to blow them over like our stick houses in Canada. <laughs> so, <laughs> Right. So let me take you back a few steps here mm -hmm. to um, some of these policies by the government. You identify that the summary of this is the fact that there's going to be a lot of multi-dwelling homes. And... To nobody's surprise, I think it's the investors that are going to grab most of those homes, and they're the ones investing in, in those right now. And to also crown that, the investors are going to be the ones getting most of this um, aids and uh, the money that is being poured through the budgets now into this. So the support is ne not necessarily going to go to the middle class or to homeowners. It's going to be to investors in this case. And, you know, I actually put this text into chat gpt i was curious what chat gpt was going to say about the summary and i was surprised actually this exactly what you said it says oh canada is going to be building a lot of multi-dwelling homes so i asked you know what's the what's the what, what are the impacts of that in the future but you've talked about it so just to do a quick summary here for making the math work the summary is to build more homes but build them in multi-unit dwellings there is going to be um, other factors that they mentioned here, like um, expanding the removal of federal taxes and whatnot, uh, launching Canada View, the Team Canada approach to building affordable homes for middle class, and all, all of that. My question to you is, are we kissing detached homes goodbye in Canada slowly? Well, they're going to be a luxury item the way things are going. Um, and it's, you know, it's a combination of, I guess the cost of construction, but it's also the land. So um, 
it's just not, it doesn't make sense to build a thousand square foot home anymore, which, you know, this is what we need to build a thousand or square foot homes. People don't need 2000 or 2,500 square foot homes for the most part detached. They need, you know, a thousand to 1500 square foot, but land so expensive or because that's another speculative item that it wouldn't make sense to buy a big piece of land and subdivide it and, and build thousand square foot homes like they used to. Now it, it's, and this, this is the problem. So, um, but again, the speculators and the investors have driven the market. So the builders have been catering to them. They said, we don't care. Give us a three bedroom. Uh, we don't care if it's a townhouse or whatever. I want it for the cheapest price and I want to collect the most amount of rent or, or I want to make the most amount of money when I resell it. So the builders haven't been building for end users because we would have lots of detached in the suburbs in, in my city. But now we always see as townhomes. People don't want townhomes in right. my city. Like they, they want detached, but it's just, it's where the market's gone. And, um, but again, the people, the end users need to take that back. And another argument people, they say it all the time. They say, look, the builders, if it wasn't for speculators, they wouldn't have built these homes. And I understand their point, but if it wasn't for speculators, then they wouldn't be building all these townhomes. We need some townhomes, but mm -hmm. now it's just like all townhomes everywhere I look. If the end users really, uh, you know, controlled the demand, the builders would have to build what the end users want. And whether you're renting or you're buying in my era, you want a detached home. You don't want a townhouse, right? You'll settle for a townhouse, but you don't want one. Yeah, I think those are things that we used to see in uh, cosmopolitan cities, not in uh, mid-sized cities or in the suburbs, like mm -hmm. like your own area. Not even in a place like Ottawa do I think we necessarily need as many townhomes as we've seen. I asked you this question the last time. So <laughs> I, I think you talked about it extensively about townhomes <laughs> and your response was quite surprising to me at first when I said, how do you make sense of this? And you say, it makes sense. <laughs> and you say that's because... Those homes were not being built for people like you and I. They yeah, were that's right. okay. Now I remember. Primarily, yeah, that was um, right. Like they were being built for investors, and mm -hmm. I would recommend that anybody watching this should check that out. Also, I think that's a very good response you gave there. So, I think we're on the verge of losing most of detached homes in in Canada, and I think that's um, that's a sad story for families, really. And that means we're gonna mm -hmm. have crowded neighborhoods because that's what you find with uh, townhomes and plenty of condominiums uh, especially now that they're building uh, townhomes and some of them have secondary units in the basement and they're for rental purposes uh, the streets are packed with cars and it, i think it's just a it, it's not an interesting thing to to see in a lot of places especially in a place like this in ottawa right yeah correct and it's you're seeing Again, you said their places are packed with cars. And I just had a call or a message from a client today, and he's going to be looking for a rental. And he saw this place, and it was a basement. And yeah, it, was a, it was a newer house, but it said it didn't come with parking. He said, John, does, are you sure it doesn't come with parking? I said, well, probably not, because it's a basement, and the, the driveway's taken. So, um, <laughs> And again, this is fine when you live in a city with great public transportation, but my city doesn't have that. Like you'll you'll be standing there in the freezing cold waiting for a bus for half an hour. Mm -hmm. and, you know it'll take you twenty minutes to get to the bus stop. So we're 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 set up uh, for driving, uh, not for public transport in in my area anyway. So I'm certain you're enjoying this interview right now, and you can't wait to get back into it. The analytics on this channel show about ninety five percent of the viewers on the channel haven't subscribed yet. So you do me a favor by clicking the subscribe button right now, and I'll keep my promise to continually improve on the quality of the conversations that are produced on this channel every time. So please click the subscribe button right now, and let's get back into the conversation. Let's go to the next conversation here, and that's Canada in a bubble. The last time we were able to show that we were... Right in the, uh, I forgot which which zone we were in the, in the bubble stage in the last conversation. I think I recommend that people check that out. But we want to know here: Are we still in a bubble, and are we expecting this bubble to burst anytime soon? You sent me some chart, uh, but to start with, I will just show this. I think this is standard 
in any market out there, in any asset class, in fact, Bitcoin, whatever it is, this is what a bubble looks like. Uh, you've talked about this extensively in your videos, so I don't know if we, we want to rehash that right now. I think I'll just recommend people check out some of your previous videos that you worked on. I'll just make one but, quick comment on it. Okay. So I'll say that you need to, so the top there where the bull trap and the denial phase is, because we haven't reached the fear mm -hmm. yet, obviously. You need, that needs to be stretched out, <laughs> right? So that, because it's a lot, it looks like a very short time frame there, but it's a long time frame right. in, in the housing market, especially. So that's all I'll say about okay. that. So. Right. And I think the, the, the next data actually shows that I pulled this up from uh, this website that, that, I, that I quoted out there. Mm -hmm. And it's just showing from 2022 up until now. I think what you're talking about, uh, that bull trap will be right around here, but it's stretched from the peak compared to, to the previous chart. That's what you're talking about. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So I will go to your own chart because I think you, you have more to say about those. Uh, how would you describe the market uh, relative to what we're seeing here? So it's, uh, again, the, the number one comment or, ne you know, argument, I guess I get on my uh, patterns that I like to pull up because I've had, uh, there's a head and shoulders prior to this. You can see it there on the chart, which is a bearish pattern. Yes. People say, well, mm -hmm. you can't compare this to stock market analysis. And I said, yes, you can, because it's been commoditized, uh, the market and financialized. And this is what happens. We go through this speculative zones or these speculative times where the reason these peaks are there is not because of end users buying homes. It's because of investors and speculators. So right now, yeah, we're these, these were predictions based on where prices would go. Right. So of course uh, this was done in February, but our March would be where that dotted line or the dash line comes up to hit the top of that pennant. We're probably pretty much there. Cause I just redid it today because Korea's data just came out to support this. So this is a bearish pennant, and uh, you look at any um, stock analysis, when you're in the, the pennant, we came from a high point in 2022 there, and what makes us bearish is we came from a high point, and now we created this, this pennant here, and uh, mm -hmm. it's going to break to the downside because it came from the upside. So given that, um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a signal or a flag there that says, yeah, was, this is the way the market will go based on this uh, pattern. So, and we can move on to the next one. Uh, if you're ready, okay. and uh, it's just a different scenario. Mm -hmm. So the next one is the double top, and that's if okay prices went up in uh, March. They like I said in the last chart, and if they keep going up, which they probably will again in April, they might you know the national average price will go up just a little bit more again, and we'll be at that double top. And a double top is well known to be a bearish pattern, and it breaks to the downside after that. So. Um, just another pattern to back up uh, a scenario that could play out and most likely will, because I don't see prices not going in this general direction, especially in the spring market. Right, right. Okay, so let's take a look at the last one you sent me here. And, so and the flag, flag yeah. And, and these are all just general, like people can research these. And, and you know, these are, again, just patterns, basic stock trading patterns where you look for these and you kind of make assumptions based off of these. And there's no, there's no bullish ones, right? These are all bearish. So the bearish flag is, again, it creates a flag, right? It's two parallel lines from and then the flagpole coming from the top and it breaks to the downside. And that would be if prices continue to rise, you know, higher than last year, um, higher than the peak last year, they go higher than that, then we would get a flag pattern. And of course, the potential to break uh, to the downside is a lot greater than it would be to the upside. Right. I think that's probably the last one there. So if, if things really align the way they sound in my mind right now, it looks like Canada is headed toward a similar scenario to the 2008 reset that they had in the United States. We didn't really have that in Canada. I was in Canada in 2008. But... Canada has escaped that that um, that market crash in 2008. So it looks like we're headed to something similar to that. Do you think? So uh, yeah, and I think that was, you know, we were lucky, but I think it gave us this sense of invincibility that you know our banking <laughs> system is so sound and um, and it's just yeah. So we kind of have this this feeling that we're untouchable. But if you look at like all the 
the factors involved, there ours are worse, like the household debt and the mortgage debt. It's like way worse than the states had it. So yeah, sure. I would see that we would play out something similar to that. And this is this is like not just picking an easy one and saying like, yeah, okay, we're we're gonna play, but like there's other real estate resets or crashes in history and they always play out the same. And uh, so again, all I'm saying is, you know, nine times out of 10, this is what happens. And I'm just supporting that theory. And if the opposite is, well, no, this time is different and it's not going to, we're not going to end up like every other real estate correction. Well, I say we are going to end up like every other real estate correction because there's a reason mm -hmm. why they play out the way they do. Right. And again, it's not just based on an assumption that it's going to happen, but it's based on you know, rising interest rates because interest rates started to rise before then and, and uh, higher unemployment right. and speculative purchasing, just like in the late 80s in Canada, it was the same thing. Mm -hmm. In the late 80s, we had a bull market and a housing bubble, and it took 10 years after for it to recover. But again, there was a lot of speculation in the 80s prior to that uh, that crash. So um, yeah, it's, this is just everything. There's nothing in this one. The only thing people add, well, you didn't have high as high immigration back then. That was the that's the only wild card that people keep playing on that they think this this immigration is going to support you know how high house prices and you know uh, I guess avoid a recession because we have all the and this is why they increased immigration is to help prop up GDP, mind you, but it's not going to be enough. It's just a temporary band aid. That uh, might take a little bit longer, an extra six months or a year for it to play out. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe get the government to the next election, right? That's could be that too. So, right, right, right. So, uh, speaking about um, some of the things you mentioned here, the the current state where Canada has found itself, especially among the G seven nations. I think it's quite a precarious state. We talked about this in the last conversation, and I'm just going to pull up some some chart here. I pulled them up from from different websites, and I'll mm -hmm. just get your reaction to them um, in a second here. So, Canada in a snapshot. What this chart shows me is that Canada is in a population trap right now in 2024. We talked about it the last time. Immigration plays a significant role in that. Our birth rate has not increased like we had in the 50s when there was a population growth similar to this. But this one is a way higher population growth that we had since 2022. The next one I will show you is that we have a record low housing deficit in Canada right now. And this has been going on for a while, but I think we fell really low this year much more. The next one I will show you is that the standard of living in Canada has been on a decline rapidly compared to the United States. This has also been going on for a while, since 2020, where we kind of squared out here. But since that time, we've been declare, declining compared to the States. So our recovery since COVID is not actually compared to the States, for instance. And mm -hmm. I would say our our economy significantly depends on the state more than any other surrounding nations around the United States. Let me show you this final one. Uh, is this the final one? Maybe not. Uh, so right now, compared to the U.S. also, uh, our GDP is getting poorer by the day. The next one also shows that we have a labor productivity that is on the decline in Canada. Those are actual factual data out there. There's a lot, lot more, but I, I think um, I'll just stop it there. Or actually, let me, let me mention this one. So it, this one I find very interesting, that the RCMP warns that Canadians <laughs> will likely protest if they find out how poor they are. I think that's actually uh, it kind of oxymoron in my mind uh, because it's, it's like saying we, ac we actually don't know how poor we are right now uh, in Canada. All of that, putting it together, uh, plus this last one here, actually, um, there is a warning that the budget this year will be the most misguided budget since the 1930s, post-World War. This is Canada at a glance. And a significant part of everything I've talked about here is the population, the housing market, the productivity rate in Canada, and the budget that is upcoming. I think the budget announcement is going to be tomorrow, if I'm correct. 
What do you make of all of these? I know this is a lot of information I just loaded you with, but what do you make of that? So I'm going to go, yeah, I'm, I have the, the slides here, so I'll go back through them, but I'll start okay. where you finished off. So the budget, the budget, okay. uh, now the budget was today. Sorry, it was up at, at the end of the day though. So uh, I haven't had a chance to really look at too much, but I've read some things online. And of course, they're talking about taxing the wealthy, uh, capital gains tax on corporations is going up to uh, 66% instead of 50%. Uh, personal, right. it's 250, still at 50. And then over that, uh, they've, it's changed. So it's a tax and spend budget from what I can tell. When it comes to housing, and th this um, housing plan is part of the budget that we went through uh, earlier, that um, my that from what I saw, and again, I did a video on it today, actually, that is the old extend and pretend. So there is things in there that, you know, uh, first time home buyers can now get a 30 year mortgage on a new home purchase. So 30 years. So you're just saying, well, here you can take on more debt because that's what's going to allow them to do. Mm -hmm. Take on more debt and pay it over longer periods of time. They can uh, take more out of their RSPs now to buy out their first home. So instead of taking 35,000, they could take 60,000 from the retirement funds. And of course they have to pay that back. So that's more debt because it has to be paid back Correct. within 15 years. And I think they added another three years, so maybe 18 now. But uh, so now you can borrow more money from your retirement and add that to your debt. So again, we're just extending and pretending um, that people can afford homes by, by stretching out payments and giving them more debt. They're the charter, the Canadian charter, all those people that were, you know, 72 year mortgages and 95 year mortgages that um, the banks allowed them to extend their amortizations without renewing. Mm -hmm. Well, they want a, they want that permanently done now, the, the Canadian charter. So that again, so now you can just keep paying interest. You're not going to actually pay off. If you're one of those people that um, had those variable rate mortgage with a fixed payment, and then it went into negative amortization. You, they're gonna the the new rules say the bank says, well, we're not gonna force you to renew, or there's gonna be options there, so you can just keep paying interest. So these people are gonna be paying nothing off their homes, their homes for years, and just paying interest. So again, this is a a uh, extend your period or extend and pretend that the economy is okay. And uh, this is one of the things that's kind of keeping this Ponzi scheme going at this point too. But again, there's there's mm -hmm. all this all this interest and in debt payment is going to slowly suck money out of the economy, so that people won't be able to invest in their own businesses. They're not going to purchase uh, big items anymore because they're going to be too indebted. Um, when right. you need and that they need kills to deleverage. the class, right? Yeah. Now with with the rest of the things. So back to the first. Oh, I won't go to the first chart because I. I'm a little rusty on that one, the Canada's population trap. But uh, the next one down, it's it's again, it is the Canadian the Canada's population trap. But it's the housing supply deficit. It's record new, or hits new record. So of course, what they're saying is, you know, they brought in all these people, all these uh, immigrants, whether they're temporary or students or permanent residents, and of course, there's not enough housing. So we have this population trap where they're bringing in all these people. And they knew there wasn't enough housing, but now we're even further behind on housing because of this population issue. And the standard of living is falling, which brings us to the next chart, um, because people, things get inflated. People can't afford rent or they, they need to pay more in rent. So now your standard of living's dropping. I see there's like reports of immigrants or, I'm sorry, not immigrants, um, temporary students or foreign students. They're literally driving to the airport with their leased car that they, you know, they would lease a cheap car and they're just leaving it at the airport. Uh, I talked to a, a mortgage broker a couple of weeks ago and he's a good friends with a repo guy. And he said, he's so busy picking up these cars at the airport. They can't keep up because the students are just fleeing the country because there's not enough work and their the standard of living sucks. And of course, now the standard of living does has gone down because you're living in basements, apartments for mm -hmm. $2,000 a month. Meanwhile, three years right. ago, you could rent a whole house for $2,000. And this is how the standard of living went down. Now, when I moved to Canada, m my parents, it was very clear. People would always say, well, why did you move to Canada, right? 
we weren't your typical immigrants, right? We're coming from, you know, the, the Ireland and, and, you know, it was an English speaking country and people didn't look at us like immigrants because we didn't look like your typical immigrant at the time. And they say, why, why would you move here? Like, and it was always, it was a higher standard of living, a better standard of living that we moved for. Well, it's not the case anymore, obviously. And, um, it's shown here in this chart where the, uh, has declined, where the U S has actually increased, um, after the pandemic and we've declined. Right. And it's because of the, the level of debt and the in run up in asset prices that people are just fueling or paying for debt every month. And when you bring in, uh, l massive levels of immigration, now the GDP of course has increased. But the GDP per capita has gone down because there's more people to share that total production of the country with. So, um, again, that's just a temporary Band-Aid bringing in, um, you know, a million plus uh, new residents every year mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. And it's again, we talked about it last time. It's it's like modern day slavery where you're literally just using them for their money to prop up GDP. So they'll come spend money. But there is no real future for them here. And uh, now you see the GDP per capita has gone way down. And uh, it's going to remain down until we start producing goods. So, um, right. yeah, and, and it gets us to the labor productivity. Labor productivity the, right. the, the government's policies are, you know, they don't allow us to use our natural resources because of their climate plans and whatnot. So, of course, how, what do we produce? We're the richest country in the world, but we can't produce anything because the government shuts the doors on everything. So, um, and yeah, like everything's nothing is environmentally friendly like even solar panels they have to be produced somewhere in factories and use mining to get the materials and but canada won't even allow mining um, in most places for raw materials because it doesn't suit their environmental goals so it's not a very realistic plan obviously the government has it's an ideology and uh, you can see it doesn't it's not working when it comes to the economy because it's in shambles and in, in every section we're failing right and they even admitted it. I just saw a press conference with somebody and they admitted like we're the lowest of the G7 for G GDP per capita. And uh, and this was not the opposition. Well, yeah, well, except the fact that it's the fault of the conservatives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, they blamed uh, the, the previous party for it. Um, just like, right. you know, with the housing crisis, they've they've had almost nine years. I think they say eight years, but since 2015 to and now they come up with a plan like it's when when <laughs> when and we're already past like they've, they've known about this for years like it's been an issue and you know it's just they come up with it now now we have a plan guys we're we're our term's almost done we're you know the the prime minister is about to get voted out but uh you know we have the best plan in canadian history um so yeah it's it's right. politics right so Right. So, so when I put all of these together, I don't think there's anything novel in saying that this takes out the middle class very quickly because it's going to stretch the middle class into high sum of loan values that they can't pay off um, in their 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 meager salary that is trying to keep up with inflation and uh, the cost of cost of groceries, the cost of home ownership, the cost of rental, uh, before you know it is going to overstretch people's personal economy. And this is how you take out the middle class, really. And coming from the kind of country that I come from, that's what really takes out the middle class. And uh, to be honest, you know, wait, I, I know some people might come after me in the comment section, but I'll see how this goes. Mm -hmm. Coming from, I, I am born and bred Nigerian. Mm -hmm. uh, coming from the part of the world, it's there that you see the government, especially when they want to do this kangaroo kind of projects that they execute, um, say the, the president is visiting one of the states, and then you see there is a lot of road construction done overnight, a road sweeping, road clearing, and, you know, students are put back in schools, the schools that were not functional before. Mm -hmm. The current approach by the Canadian government is just a little, you know, a notch up of that level of insanity, to be honest, um, where you're trying to paint a perfect picture, like, oh, we're working, but all along for like 10 years, you did nothing. It's just right when you need the votes from the people that you say, oh, now we're going to do something about your situation. And I think, like, let me get your response to this. So for, from my understanding, I've been in Canada now for, for about nine years, going to 10 years. 
from my understanding, it looks like the country does not actually elect leaders. It looks like the country votes out leaders. And what I mean is, I think the last election was more of everybody got fed up or most people got fed up with the conservatives. I think you mentioned that in our last conversation as well. And then that's how this current administration came into power. Where does that lead us, especially knowing that there will be an election very soon? I know you're not a politician, but what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, I remember when Harper was in government and I can't even remember why he was so hated at the end, but it was, it was more to do with like, I don't think it was anything to do with the economy. And I, I could just research this, but it's, and we always think back and like, he wasn't so bad, right? It's, I think it was more of the ideology and, um, you know, this, his old school ways of the conservative ways where we wanted to move forward into this more modern country. And I was even on board mm -hmm. with the more modern, you know, prime minister and, uh, I didn't vote for him, thankfully. So you can't blame me, but, uh, he was, <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, this guy's not like, I didn't, we didn't hate him. We didn't say, oh, I hope this guy never wins. Like, you know, in the States, you know, you have the politics over there in 2016, there was none of that. It was just like, but people hated, um, Harper at the end, but I think it was just because he, when you're around for so long, you can only serve for so long before people get fed up with you and you need to bring someone new in. So, uh, and that was why we were voting on this, maybe this new, modern, young, fresh face. And, um, but, you know, we look back and maybe it wasn't so bad, right? And, uh, and, and Trudeau was great in the first few years. Like people loved him and, you know, I don't know what he actually did uh, <laughs> for the country, but he said some nice things. But then, he just started going too extreme and too far left, right? Um, where, you know, there's, it, it can only go so far. And now we're seeing people have given up on that, those hopes of, um, you know, his, his social uh, things that he was doing, um, you know, equality and, 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 you know, reparations or not reparations, uh, you know, with, with all this stuff he did um, for, you know, indigenous people. And this is all great and well needed. But, you know, that's a part of the equation. But he, he didn't fulfill even those when you talk about fresh drinking water, like he promised in all these communities. He didn't actually do those, but he talks about them. He talks a, a big talk. And when it comes to the economy, he's the worst. Like, he's probably the worst prime minister in Canadian history. So um, I think that people voted with their hearts instead of with their brains when it comes to Trudeau. And uh, because he does, he is a, he is a good politician, right? He says the right things. He knows how to pull at your, your heartstrings and, uh, and get the votes. And he got a lot of the, those female votes and the, the, the 905 soccer moms, whatever they call them. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's great. Like the liberal, the liberal kind of agenda, it's, it's a good, you know, thing for society. And somebody said something the other day about, you know, the, the, the liberals, they, they put their, they put their foot on the accelerator while the conservatives, they have their foot on the brake. Right. <laughs> and, and that's <laughs> where you want to move forward and you want to move forward into this modern country. You do it with him, but, but it, there was no real plan for the economy because the economy was fine. He didn't have to talk about the economy. He had to talk about climate change and uh, whatever other social issues he, he had to talk about. I think legalizing marijuana maybe or something. Um, and, uh, medically assisted suicide or something these these were the platform the kind of things he ran on because money wasn't an issue but when money and housing becomes sure. an issue people don't care about those other social issues now they're sick of them <laughs> they're like you know what right i'm starving and i got nowhere to live i couldn't care less who's equal and who's not at this point like i want i got to take care of myself right and this is where we're at yeah. and it's sad that we got to this point but this is what they've created and uh, charity Charity can only go so far, and this is uh, it's it looks like it's ended in Canada right now, right? And I think this is a point where, as much as possible, uh, people need to begin to make up their mind to what really matters to them. And uh, I'll get your reaction to this question as well. People need to get to the point that they decide what really matters to them in every election, and it's also in this kind of situation that we realize that every level of leadership in the country matters, no matter how much we want to overlook it or overestimate it, they really matter. The, the choices we make or the choices we don't make, they really matter. But let, 
Let me get your thoughts. So, this is 2024, and I've been asking these questions to you. people I've been talking to on the podcast behind the scenes, but I think I want to start asking people actually while on the podcast. There's a lot of conversations out there now, probably way more than ever before. I think right now, you know, a platform like YouTube for you and I, right? You can sit and toss a mic on the desk and you can have a good conversation and people out there can see it compared to even 10, 20 years ago, right? The, the mm -hmm. platform wasn't there. There is a whole lot of conversations, but I think more and more in me uh, trying to analyze modern society and some of the challenges that are peculiar to, this, to, to, to modern society, I realize in spite of all the conversations out there, there's still the weakness in the way people make choices still. And I have been asking this. How can you pull conversations together to actually make an impact? Elections are going to be around the corner in, in a matter of months now. But how can conversations actually matter in the minds of people such that we're not waiting for another election to be called or like in the United States, you're, you're waiting for the next four years to vote out the incumbent. But are people actually powerless in the four years while the term is ongoing, what should people really derive from meaningful conversations? What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. It's it's almost like you feel powerless in between elections, and um, you, do? you know, with with the example here now, you know, the opposition in Canada they've really focused on what Canadians want, and they've done great. And you can see in the polls, they focused on housing, and people want housing and jobs, right? And 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 finally, the government caught on, and now they're focusing on housing because it was always climate change, climate change, climate change. And again, if <laughs> if you have to ask somebody, do you care about feeding your family or do you care about climate change that you may or may not have an impact on? I think the answer is going to be pretty clear. So when it comes to, yeah, like when you're in between election cycles, what do you do? Well, you have to speak up you have to call your mps you have to maybe protest when things get really bad you see protests break out and i i say this quite often when people say well prices are just going to keep going up and i say if prices even stay the same let alone go up you're going to see civil unrest and civil disobedience because people can only take so much and every day that passes less people can afford a home right now in canada and more people Younger people are entering that home buying phase that can't afford a home and they're, they've given up hope. So why would people work? Why would people do what they're supposed to do, right? Because that's what people say. It, it kills you've, productivity, yes. Yeah, you've done, and they always say it, you've done what you're supposed to do. You went to school or you got a career or whatever the case may be, you should be able to afford a home. And even they say it uh, in that housing plan in the first paragraphs before they get into those three sections. They talk about uh, you know, young Canadians they work hard. They should be able to afford a home. They shouldn't be spending any more than 30% of their income on a home. Well, that can only go on for so long before society <laughs> starts to fall apart and starts to get right. disrupted. And, and this is what I hope, I hope this is the road that we don't go down, but if it continues, we will. Um, so the only other option is to make housing affordable, uh, not more unaffordable, right? So... Uh, so yeah, so hopefully we don't see that extreme, but I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibilities, but we need right. to, yeah, we need to speak up, have a voice uh, in whatever way you can use the social media. This is what I do. Uh, I, I put it out there all the time. And, and again, no realtors say this, but today I put out, um, I, something about, I see 2017 prices in Canada's future, right? And people love that because it gives them hope. And, um, mm -hmm. when they have, a, and, and that I can spread hope. And, and again, I back it up with the charts. Uh, you didn't see it on the charts we, we looked at today, but in my latest video today I just made, I have predictions that easily show that we could be at 2017 prices. And people would take 2017 prices any day right now. In February, sorry, in January 2023, the average price in Canada was $612,000. In all of Canada, the average house price, 612000 That was in January 2023. In April, sorry, March 2017, the average price of a house was $559,000. So that's what, 
fifty three thousand dollars difference and that and in that so that people don't realize how close we were just over a year ago to those prices and we had no recession and we had low unemployment at that point so yeah i think that yeah you gotta you gotta know that you know good always prevails i'm a big believer in that so whether you're, you're religious or not it doesn't matter it's good there is evil out there we have evil forces and greed greed is one of those forces that can be evil and it's it's is evil it's uh, depending on what uh, religion you are but uh, it's it's in the, one of the, those sins so uh, greed is an evil force but good good will prevail and uh, i believe that uh, people will realize this and uh, and think you know what this is something's not right here when their kids can't afford a home right uh, it's okay that, that people right. say well i'm i'm happy my house is a million dollars now and i say well not if not well, what about when your kids or your grandkids want to buy a home? Are you going to be happy? Because why do you need your home to be worth a million dollars for? It? Are you selling it and taking the cash or something? Like it doesn't matter. It does it. Does, so end users, it's no benefit for high house prices. It only benefits speculators and investors, and um, right. that's what people have to realize. There's no pride. I, I wouldn't be proud that my house is double the price it should be. It does. It doesn't do me any good. What if I want to move? I got to buy one that's double the price, right? Right. Well, l let me get you something that could um, annoy you a little bit. Let's see. No, uh, just yeah, as we I begin to it, wrap yeah. up here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just get your reaction. Oh, we listen to them every day on YouTube. <laughs> okay, so let me get your reaction to this. If you're mm -hmm. renting right now, you're going to want to hear this. Our upcoming budget is going to make renting fairer. That means making sure you can see what previous tenants of your apartment paid so you can negotiate a fair deal. It means making sure that your rent payments are counted by the bank towards your credit score. It doesn't make any sense for someone who pays $2,000 a month in mortgage payments to get credit for it, but not someone who's paying $2,000 in rent. And we're bringing in new rights and protections for renters so that you don't have to stand up to rent evictions, bad landlords, or rent hikes alone. It's all part of making renting fairer, and it's part of giving you a leg up for when it comes time to buy your own home. This is what our upcoming budget is going to do to focus on making the housing market fairer for every generation. I think I should add this one to it, actually. Uh, I have this other one here. I think we've talked uh, quite a bit about the the fa fabricated homes. So I'll just show you the one from the housing minister here. I'm sure you've seen this one as well. I we are living in a housing crisis, about it. but it's not the first time Canada's been here. Uh, after the Second World War, when many thousands of soldiers were returning home to be reunited with their families at once, uh, Canada faced enormous housing crunches. Uh, one of the tools that was deployed at the time to respond uh, to the challenges they faced at, uh, at that particular point in time was the development of simple pre-approved designs by uh, Wartime Housing Limited. In fact, uh, they adopted uh, designs that many will remember as victory homes or strawberry box homes that can be observed uh, right across the country. Uh, it's uh, a coincidence of it today that we've got the uh, member for Ajax here with me. Uh, the city was more or less built uh, on the concept that these uh, these homes could provide uh, a pathway to address the uh, housing challenges that, that existed after the Second World War. Um, what followed in the decades uh, to come uh, was a continued practice of abiding by this principle that pre-approved designs uh, would provide a, a simple and cost-effective way to actually build homes. Uh, I actually brought with me today uh, a catalog from 1954 uh, that provided small home designs. This is a particular issue was on uh, bungalows and split-level houses, and for a fee of $10, you could actually uh, have access to designs that um, uh, could be built quickly. Uh, and many. Okay. I'm just going to pause it there. I forgot to ask you if you wanted to hear all of these in English, in Irish, in French, or in gibberish. <laughs> but how far removed from reality do you think this government is as we're end up? So both of them are great at speaking, right? This is, this is what they are. They're politicians. They're very fluid and, and you know, they present a good, uh, a good argument, uh, emotional argument, I guess I should say. When it comes to the pre-approved designs, uh, again, it's an emotional uh, catch for people. Uh, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but without the land and the infrastructure, who knows? Um, I think the actual 
design of homes is the least of our worries because you can't, it doesn't make sense to put a thousand or 1200 square foot pre-approved affordable, con, affordably constructed home on a lot these days, because it's going to cost you 250,000 for the construction of the home, but 400,000 for the lot and to service it. And this is in my area, even more in other areas. So not very realistic there, unless you have a other solution to go along with it. Uh, with regards to the, the PM there on the last one, uh, we actually had a discussion with a property management team well before this because it is an option now for landlords. You can actually uh, get your tenants to sign on to report them to the credit bureau, and uh, it gives them it does give them a credit history. And we we, we didn't even ask the tenants because we we brainstormed this. It was four of us, and it only took us about five minutes to figure this out. We said, why would any tenant? want to be reported to the credit bureau. It, it, it does nothing for them. And I'll explain why. Mm -hmm. uh, a tenant with good credit history, they don't need to be reported. Why would you want someone else reporting you? You have good credit history. You have an 800 credit score, whatever the case may be. Who cares if, you, if somebody else says you're paying a bill? You don't need to be reported. So people, tenants with bad credit, they don't want to be reported. They're not right. So that, so they wouldn't sign on. Okay. So we say that. So no one's gonna. This this is useless um, for for most people. Like I'm sure it might help a couple of people, but but in general, it's useless. And with the we talk about rent payments and the history of the rent payments, that is just nonsense. That's like saying how much did you buy your house for? And I want to know the history. Well, you you do know the history, and you know okay, house prices were a lot cheaper you know, years ago, well, what does it matter? You're looking at today's value or today's the market value. So that's, that's nonsense. It's, it's the biggest nonsense I've heard. Now, the one thing, and I thought about this today and, you know, I, I when he's talking and, and, and it's very interesting. And this is the thing I took away from it. And you have to listen to the wording and get past all the emotional BS that these politicians are spewing. It used to be uh, with Trudeau, it was, you know, equity and inclusion and rights and all this stuff. He has literally gone to fair now. This is called the fair housing and the fair policy and fairer. <laughs> he's seeing it. And if you, fair is not equal. Okay. We're not talking about having equal opportunities or, and, you know, all, so this was the messaging, right? And, and I agree with the equality and the equal opportunities and all the rest of this, but we've been downgraded to fair and fair is not equal. Fair just means I'm treating you fair. Yeah, you, you're you going to live in a uh, tiny home or a shipping container, but I'm going to treat you fair while you're applying and living in it. And it's going to be a fair deal. I'm not going to rip you off for it. So the, the messaging is very weak and we've been downgraded to this, this fair. And we used to say it to our kids, well, they say, mom, you know, that's not fair. And we'd say, well, fair is not equal. Just because your brother got a new bicycle, it's, it, it doesn't mean equal. You get a new bicycle. Maybe you got rollerblades. This is what's fair for you is not equal, right? So it's we've uh, really take the we've took the messaging down, or he has taken the messaging down a, a good few levels now to just treating people fair instead of treating people equal. And of course, Justin Trudeau, he's never rented. He's never had to buy a home. He's, he has. He knows nothing personally right. about the situations mm -hmm. he's talking about. He's. Uh, literally like the worst person that could be dealing with this. You need people that have, you know, had experience working or buying homes or being the middle class. And he's never been, he's never even had a taste of it. So right. terrible messaging. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, I think some of those problems is actually the, it's the problem of the overprivileged class. And I must say that this kind of, this kind of messaging exists in most societies around the world, even from the one I come from where, People are so detached from the reality of the average person out there. And that's because of the level of privileges that they grew up with and that they have access to in the position of power that they, that they occupy. And I think um, that really uh, describes the current state of, of Canada. And to tie everything that you just talked about just now with where we started from, you talked about the fact that this government has gone from talking about equality to um, equity and then talks about climate change and now it's fairness. And I think when you package all of these, one word that I heard repeated most often is the word kindness. But then you forget that on the scale of human virtues, kindness is actually 
uh, way lower in priority and in fact an importance compared to honesty and honesty is what we're lacking out here uh, in fr from the messaging from from the politicians in this case so i think if any if anything that we should be looking for so that people gain some level of value from even chatting about politics and uh, messaging here is honesty is actually what should be demanded from politicians and i think that's what you've been talking about but well i'll let you have a final word here just for a few seconds and so i guess in closing i i try to give people the hope and it's not false hopes it's based on you know numbers that i and, and my research that i do and i've done a lot of research in the last couple of years especially so the hope and the hope is that and the common sense would be that prices will become more affordable at some point because the problems that will be created from that not happening are going to be too immense for society to sustain so have faith that you know somebody whether it's this government or the next government or the market itself will fix itself will write itself will revert to the mean whatever the case may be so um and of course we have and the numbers don't lie so now you have record immigration but we have home sales at the lowest levels in over a decade so it again that's that's a big one that proves that immigration is not going to create housing madness like people saying because that's the only thing really left on the table at this point mm -hmm. and we've kind of seen that um, argument disappear recently and of course now the government's coming in with uh, just mass producing homes how, however they can so have hope and have faith that the uh, the housing market uh, will turn in your favor and i believe the worst of it is behind us at this point right right well i agree with you on that i think the worst is behind us at least for the cycle of inflation that we have in the housing yeah. market I think the worst is behind us <laughs> there might be there might still be terrible ones to come in the future yeah well thank you very much john uh, thank you for taking the time to sit down with me again this time doing a very late night conversation uh, out here in uh, the eastern standard time and thank you thank you for your contribution to all the topics that we've chatted through and hopefully get to uh, come back together again and have some more possibly more interesting and more positive things to talk about then than the ones we chatted through today yeah hopefully we do see some positive numbers going forward uh, at some point soon sooner than later all right so thank you very much john